So now we're going to move into talking about penile implants. Um, this is a passion for me. It's what uh, I do a lot of. I sort of have a natural reputation in this area for doing penile implants. Um, so I, I have uh, a, a good skill in this area, and, and I love to share this with people because not everyone knows much about it. There's a lot of mis misinformation out there, a lack of education on this topic. Uh, so I find it's very, very uh, rewarding for me to get out there and, and teach about it. But um, I find that I can just use this one slide to teach you a lot. Um, there are different kinds of penile implants, first of all. And um, but before I say that, I just want to say something about penile implants. You know, penile implants. When I when I told you about that first pick, that first slide with all the modalities, and you saw all the different modalities on there, and I kind of mentioned that we can really choose whichever modality we want, you know, up front. We don't really have to go in a stepwards fashion, um, although we do do pills as first line therapy. But I guess what I wanted to try to point out to you is that um, penile implants are completely spontaneous in the way they work. They're virtually 100% reliable and they ultimately have no ongoing side effects and costs once they're done and insurance often does cover these procedures. So it just gives you an idea that in terms of statistics, in terms of actual, the, the way things work out practically, this actually becomes the single best long-term treatment option that we actually can offer statistically long-term because of the, the way this thing works and, and, and the way it uh, compares to other modalities. Now, as mentioning to you that there are different kinds of implants, for the purposes of our discussion tonight, we're gonna to talk about inflatable implants, and that's just because they're the most common in the United States, and they're the, they have the highest satisfaction rates, and that's what most commonly done. But there are malleable rods that don't inflate, that just stay hard all the time, and those are options, but path, that's a path less chosen, at least in the United States. And then there are different kinds of inflatables, but I simplify it for you just by saying, let's just talk about a three-component penile implant. And when you look at this diagram, you can see from the diagram that there's a pump in the scrotum, there's a reservoir that hides right next to the bladder behind your pubic bone and it holds salt water, and there are these cylinders that traverse the shaft of your penis. Keep this in mind, this is all inside, it's all invisible, and it's all connected, okay? So that's, that's how it's done. So it's a procedure. It is a minimally invasive outpatient procedure that we put in through a one-inch opening where your pubic hair is located, and, and we put everything in through that. So it's all inside, all invisible, all connected. When we pump the pump, we'll create a natural looking erection that will last for as long as you want, whenever you want. And so when people hear about that, they say, wait a minute, I can have an erection, a rock solid erection for as long as I want, whenever I want. There's no time limit on it. It's not like we're a pill or an injection or whatever, you have a time limit. And if it gets to be too long, you have priapism. Here you can have an erection that lasts for as long as you want, whenever you want. Even if you have an orgasm, you maintain that erection until you hit the little button that you might be able to see on the pump that helps release the fluid back out of the cylinders. So already when I talk to guys, that's already like a real eye opener. Like, you're kidding me. I can have an erection for as long as I want, whenever I want, even if I have five orgasms. Yes. And so some people kind of kid around and say, well, maybe you're sexually enhanced or maybe kid around and say you're sexually invincible when you have a penile implant because, you know, it's just, it, it, just by the way it works. This does not affect sensation. This does not affect how you orgasm. This does not affect how you ejaculate. It has nothing to do with any of that. It is invisible, so no one can tell you have it, so it's very discreet. What I mean by that is it won't go off in the airport, for example, or if you're single and you have a new partner, probably a new partner couldn't tell right away, although an astute observer will figure this out. It's a very natural looking and feeling device in the way it, in way it uh, when you pump it up and how it looks and feels for both you and a male or female partner. So whether you're homosexual or whether you're heterosexual, it doesn't matter, it works wonderful for for both sex, uh, for both sexual preferences. Um, so I said it's natural, it's uh, it's invisible, it's durable. Um, so we talk about uh, 90, well, in this slide, it says 94% success at seven years. I usually quote 90% success at 10 years. So it's a very durable result. And what I tell people is that if it breaks, it's not toxic, it's just salt water. We can take old ones out and put brand new ones in. So there's no issue there. And infection rates, like we're putting a prosthetic into your body, is less than 1%. And I say that less than 1% because the products are antibiotic impregnated. They are coated with rifampin and minocycline that leach into the tissues over a two week period of time after we put the implant. So infection rates have dropped in skilled implanters like myself to less than 1% of the time. 
And when you put all that together, people report like in the high 90% satisfaction just because of its spontaneity, its reliability, the lack of ongoing side effects and costs, which distinguish it from other modalities. Um, in terms of the actual process, like in terms of how we do it, um, we do the procedure I mentioned to you through a small one inch opening where your pubic hair is. So think about your pubic hair right above your penis in the midline We make a one inch opening. Through that tiny opening, we put all the components and you go home the same day. You're completely inflated overnight. Therefore, um, we need to have a catheter to pee, a little drain to pick up extra fluid so you don't get swollen and we wrap you up nice and tight. On post-up day one in the morning, we see you back in the office, we take it all off. And I usually like to brag because it doesn't look like we did the surgery. It just doesn't. There's very little swelling, almost no black and blue, a very modest recovery over the last 24 hours, and on we go. By the end of one week, 95% of men are off pain pills that they even took them. And by the end of three weeks, we're teaching you how to inflate and deflate the device, and you're finished in three weeks. The whole thing is over, done. Um, I will tell people to uh, take it light, uh, for three weeks not to work out or do anything heavy, but people get back to work there. I've done a physician that got back, actually a urologist who got back to work on day four and day five, back to doing his full schedule. So it's it's very possible to get back to basics. I mean, if you're someone who lifts heavy work and does construction or you know in some kind of an industry where you're physical, certainly you might need more time to recover. But in general, the average person is back very quickly and recovers nicely. Next slide. So this is a demonstration video. I'll animate, I mean, it's an animation, but I'll, I'll uh, sort of dick, uh, I'll um, narrate it. I'll narrate it for you. So as you can see, what we're gonna show is a guy who has a flaccid penis. He reaches down for the pump, begins to pump it, and you can start to see the fluid moving from the reservoir into the cylinders to create a very natural looking heart erection that will last for as long as he wants, whenever he wants. And then when it's done, whenever you want to, you hit the button, the button will release the fluid back into the reservoir and the penis becomes soft and looks as natural as it ever did. And that's the simple demonstration. There's nothing more to it than that, actually. Um, obviously, I can't talk about doing a, a, a surgical procedure without discussing some risks. Obviously, um, you know, most people usually choose a less invasive option as a first line therapy. Um, most people will at least try the pills or the injections for that matter. And if pills and injections fail, the single best long-term treatment is a penile implant. Health insurance will usually cover this, and this is gonna vary based on different areas of the country. Shockingly, some, you know, in my area in Phoenix, we have certain uh, third-party payers that don't cover it often, like Blue Cross Blue Shield won't cover it in my community, or Cigna might not cover it in my community, but United Healthcare, Aetna Humana, uh, TRICARE for Life, you know, VAs, system will always cover medicare covers medicare covers if you have medicare and a secondary you're completely covered we do cash pay business a lot there are people who just doesn't cover and we uh we offer a cash pay price for it um, and we can certainly talk more about that at a later time um really important here natural and spontaneous erections are not possible after we do a penile implant so once you've made the decision to go down this line you can't sort of step back out of it and then go well i just don't want to do that now um, because you won't have natural spontaneous erections afterwards. But I make the analogy of like getting a hip replacement. Like when you're bone on bone, you can't stand and you're getting injections into your hip and you're doing all that. And then all of a sudden you get the hip replacement. You can run, jump and ski. But very often, it's not a common thing where someone goes, take my hip out. I don't want it anymore. That's really not the way it works. Most people are really happy that they're now back in life and functioning and, and, and you know, in this case, back to intimacy and having normal relationship with their significant other. Um, mechanical failure is inevitable. It's a 90% success at 10 years. It's, it's inevitable. It Some day in its life, if you use this thing, it will break. That's because it's like everything has a mechanical uh, uh, statistic on it. However, um, removal replacement is not a big deal. And this slide is a little interesting because it says removal and replacement can cause the penis to become shorter, curved, and scarred. I disagree with that. Um, removal and replacement in a natural setting does not cause that problem. However, if someone did have an infection, for example, and we had to remove and replace it, certainly then there can be issues with fibrosis getting shorter, curved, or scarred. But in general, when I do removal and replacements, the contrary is the case. I often actually have to add more implant because the penis has had a girth, uh, uh, an expansion over time, a tissue expansion due to the implant being there for so many years, and I end up having put a larger implant. So that's what usually happens. 
Um, pain and infection can occur, but it's very, very limited to the healing process. Infection is less than 1%. And just to make mention that men that are diabetics that are not well controlled um, potentially have a higher rate of infection. Certainly spinal cord injury patients that do clean intermittent catheterizations and potentially have contaminated urines can have a higher rate of infection. And open sores anywhere in the body would make me cancel the case just for an increased risk for infection. Next slide. So that's all on the different modalities. Um, certainly for more information, talk to a prosthetic urologist, someone who's more comprehensive, who can offer penile implants as a solution that is well-versed in all the treatment options as a subspecialty. Certainly if you have more questions, Boston Scientific has a wonderful site called edcure.org. If you wanna follow up with me, it's really easy to follow with me. I just go to drblick.com, you spell out the word doctor, Spell out the word doctor, drblick.com, and you can follow me, and I'm happy to sometimes answer questions or, or, or make appointments or facilitate your care. Um, and uh, that sort of ends the, this portion of the talk. Just a little bit about the penal implant. I might try, this is an interesting unit, but you might be able to see it. Um, what's happening here is there's a pump right inside. You can't see the pump because it's invisible, just like in real life. But if I get the pump and I begin to pump it, you will see that I'll start to go a real rhythm. So it's a squish, reinflate, squish, reinflate. And what you should start to see is that the penis will start to rise um, and get more rigid, which is, it is doing. I don't know if you can see that, but it is. Let's see if I change the angle a little just to give you a sense. So here we go, just pumping. And it gets to be, eventually it gets to a point where you can't pump it anymore. That's how you know it's full, because you just can't pump it anymore. I tell people to try to over pump it because they can't break it, they're not strong enough get the maximum rigidity and you'll end up with a very solid, firm, hard erection. When you're ready to release, all you do is hit the button and it will go down and you just push, actually squeeze it if you wish to, to bring it full, more fully to, to soft and it'll just all go right to soft. And that's sort of a, the different modalities that we have here. So, so I think that covers, you know, a lot. It's a lot of information in a short time. Um, I think we're at a place now where we can probably go to take some questions. All right, uh, moving on to some implant questions. Does your libido change when you get an implant? No, <laughs> it doesn't. All right, uh, next one here. I'm a cyclist. Uh, how would an implant affect my ability to continue riding my bike? Um, you're okay to ride your bike. Um, it's no, it won't affect your ability to ride your bike. You can, yeah, you're safe to do it. No issues whatsoever. Okay. Uh, next question here, are implants suitable for patients who have a bladder sling installed? Um, yeah, you can have a, in fact, we often do them at the same time. So you can have a, I, I might not call it a bladder sling, I'll call it a urethral sling. And the sling is often placed, you know, down below through a perineal incision. And we can put that into position and fix the male leakage problem often found after, let's say, prostate cancer surgery. And at the exact same time, go then put the legs down out of stirrups and do a penile implant at the exact same time. So no issues whatsoever. We do them together all the time. All right. Uh, next question here. How old is too old to get implant surgery? Well, let's say it this way. The oldest I ever did was 89. So it really comes down to your specific situation, how healthy you are, how, how your heart, how well is your heart to tolerate a very basic minimally invasive procedure. You know, if you're healthy enough, we can do it almost at any age. Uh, I know that for a fact, there have been people who have done in their 90s. So, um, so there's really no restriction on age. It's very circumstantial and very specific to people's, uh, you know, needs. Wow, good for those people in their 90s. Imagine. <laughs> yeah, I wish, God bless them. Yeah, hopefully we're all that lucky. Um, Next question here, are there penile implants that can make your penis length longer? So the answer is yes. Uh, there are different, product, different products on the market, um, but within Boston Scientific's uh, armamentarium, they have a product that expands in length and girth. And so in the, depending on the size of your penis, we often will utilize that in order to enhance long-term success because it, because there is a tissue expansive effect to the penile implant. And so if you're somebody who is slightly on the shorter side and does not have Peyronie's disease, we often use this LGX product, which expands in length and girth. Um, 
If you're someone who has a longer penis and or happens to have Peyronie's disease or curvature, we tend to use something called the CX cylinder because it's more rigid and um, will help with the straightening of the penis better. Um, although it doesn't have the exact you know penile lengthening property to it, but the so the answer is yes, we have that product. It can be utilized in really all lengths. But as we go into longer lengths, that product can sometimes lose some axial rigidity. And so I tend to use the more rigid cylinder for my longer penises and for Peyronie disease. And I use this LGX expansive cylinder for my slightly shorter penises. And that's that's my sort of algorithm. But that's a little bit of a long-winded answer to that question. But yes, that product exists. Gotcha. And speaking of Peyronie's disease, we had a question about that regarding implants. Well, having both Peyronie's disease and scar tissue from injections create complications in prosthetic implant surgery. Well, I'm sorry, I, for some reason I didn't, could you repeat that? Sure, so will having Peyronie's disease uh, from injections create complications in prosthetic implant surgery? Okay, so if you've had a penile implant, you can't inject your penis. Uh, you're, you're if asking it right. No, so did, did I hear that right? Like in other words, if you're you 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 could certainly be someone who's an injector and develop scarring that causes curvature, and then the penile implant is a treatment of choice to straighten that curvature. But if you're someone who has a penile implant for erectile dysfunction, never again would you need to inject your penis. You would you would injure the device and cause it to to deflate. So yeah, so absolutely. Maybe, I think they're just right? Yeah, they're just asking if there would be any extra complications if you had Peyronie's disease, if you're considering an implant. Ah, I see. Yeah, and if you're considering an implant with Peyronie's, it's not, there won't be extra complications. It can make the surgery sometimes more challenging. It can sometimes require extra correctional uh, surgery, meaning that once the implant is in, if the curvature is so severe that we are not having an adequate result, we can sometimes straighten the penis with extra correctional surgeries, although those are kind of rare. We don't do them all the time. But I will tell you this, penile implant straightens the penis for Peyronie's disease beautifully. So like if you have 30, 40 degrees curvature, you may come out straight after the penile implant, just, just because the implant has that uh, tissue expansive property to, and rigidity to it that it straightens the penis all on its own. So the treatment of choice for erectile dysfunction and Peyronie's disease together is a penile implant. All right. Uh, last question here around implants. Uh, do implants help with climacteria? after radical prostatectomy? So climacteria, for those who might not know, means when you have an orgasm, you might leak urine. And so there are techniques for when you place a, uh, a penile implant, if you've got very mild incontinence, instead of doing a male sling at the same time, there's a little technique called a mini jupette technique, which you do the penile implant through a scrotal approach, and apply a little band between the two cylinders. And when the implant inflates, it gets rid of the climacteria. So, so it's, it's possible to fix the climacteria with a, with a penile implant in place. It's possible to know that you have it and, and potentially do a procedure up front that might minimize that complication postoperatively. Um, certainly if we're doing a male sling and a penile implant uh, for incontinence, that, that often gets rid of it as well. But uh, the answer is that we can treat that climacteria in multiple ways, uh, depending on your situation.